Chapter 5 Transition Metals. This is the first of four video lectures regarding transition metals. We're going to begin on page 163. The term transition elements originally was coined to denote the B group elements in the middle of the periodic table because they provided a transition from the base formers on the left, groups 1A and 2A metals, and the acid formers on the right, group 5A to 7A. Recall that metal oxides typically form basic solutions, whereas the non-metal oxides typically form acidic aqueous solutions, or also neutral, as you know. Now the term transition elements actually applies to both D and F transition elements, all of which are metals, but is commonly used to denote the D transition metals only. The F transition metals, that is the lanthanides and actinides, are usually called rare earths or inner transition metals. Now transition metals are located between group 2A and group 3A, but strictly speaking, D transition metals must have partially filled D orbitals. So zinc, cadmium, and mercury, what about them? Take a look at this table of electron configurations as we look at this. Zinc, cadmium, and mercury, here are their electron configurations. They have completely filled D orbitals. 3D10, 4D10, 5D10, and are actually therefore called post-transition metals. But they're often referred to as transition metals because of similar properties. We say, what about copper, 3D10, silver, 4D10, gold, 5D10, and even palladium, 4D10? Well, these have filled D orbitals as well. However, their cations, at least with plus two cations, have partially filled D orbitals. So this transition metal business is quite a elitist club. You have to have a certain electron configuration to join the club. Page 164. General properties of transition metals. Well, they're all metals. Most are harder, more brittle, and have higher melting points and boiling points and heats of vaporization than the non-transition metals. Their ions and compounds are often colored. That's interesting. They form many coordination complexes. A coordination complex is one involving a certain type of covalent bond that we'll discuss later on in this chapter. Most have multiple oxidation states, not just one or two. They could have a lot. Many of the metals and their compounds are good catalysts. The energies of the 3D and 4S orbitals are nearly equal and so the 3D orbitals are filled after the 4S orbital instead of before they're filled. Recall potassium is 4S1 and then calcium is 4S2 then scandium is 4S2, 3D1 so the 3D1s are filled after the 4S. Chromium and copper are exceptions to the filling order of the first transition series. They have only one electron in their 4s orbital, and they have one extra electron in the 3d orbital. I wonder where that came from. Must have come from the 4s. And this apparently gives a more favorable, more stable configuration. Recall that in the th first transition series, 3d. Chromium promoted an electron from the 4s to the 3d, as did copper. Now the 4D and 5S and 5D and 6S orbitals are even closer in energy than are the 3D and 4S orbitals, making electron configurations difficult to predict. There's some exceptions here. More difficult in the second and third transition series compared to this first transition series we're familiar with. The properties of transition metals can be correlated roughly with either the total number of D electrons or the number of unpaired electrons. Let's look at melting points. The alkali metals melt below 200 degrees Celsius. That's pretty low. Several post-transition metals like gallium and tin and lead, they're pretty low melting as well. 
Transition metals typically have melting points greater than a thousand degrees, way up here and above. Tungsten is the highest melting of all the metals at about 3400 degrees Celsius. You might be wondering what's the highest melting element of all. It turns out it's carbon, melting point around 3800 degrees Celsius. And mercury is of course the exception to the rule. It's a liquid at room temperature. It has the lowest melting point of all the metals, negative 39. Here it is way down here. So notice here in the, the fourth period these are the 3D elements, and in the fifth period, these are the 4D transition metals, and in the sixth period, these are the 5D transition metals. Look at the extremely high melting points on these metals. Page 165. Let's look at atomic size. Atomic size decreases from left to right across each transition metal series as the net core charge increases. Does that sound familiar? Remember we looked at the net core charge across the A group elements? Lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, and so on. What was the reason for that? Remember that the outer electron on lithium feels an attractive force of three protons less two inner electrons, so we see the net attractive force, the effect of nuclear charge, is three minus two or plus one. But beryllium has four protons pulling on the outer electrons, four minus two electrons is plus two. As the net core charge increases, the elements shrink left to right across each period. Well, the same is true for the transition metals. But size then increases at the far right, groups 1b and 2b, as valence electron repulsion increases as the d orbitals fill. Remember, you're not just putting six electrons in p orbitals, but rather the d orbitals hold 10 electrons. And that explains the decreasing density to the right end of the graph below. So take a look at this. This is density versus group number. As we reach the, the B group elements, the density increases significantly, but then it tails off toward the right end, group 1B and 2B of the transition metals. Atomic size, as expected, increases down all groups in the periodic table as additional shells of electrons are added with increasing atomic mass and this holds for the first and second row transition metals. Here's the first row transition metals and the second as we go down they're going to increase in size. But for the third transition row metals, well it turns out they're just about the same size as the second row. So this group here from lanthanum through to mercury are about the same size as yttrium through cadmium. This unexpected shrinkage, now it's not actually a shrinkage, it's just they didn't increase in size, but it's referring to it as a shrinkage, is called the lanthanide contraction. What causes that? The lanthanide contraction of period six, this is the third transition series of period six, occurs because these elements contain an additional 14 electrons in 4f orbitals. So not only are we filling the Ds, but we also, after lanthanum, we have the first group of lanthanides. There's 14 more protons and electrons fit in bef before hafnium. So the effective nuclear charge increases by 15 between lanthanum and hafnium, the first and second elements in the third transition series. So you follow that? Here's lanthanum, now we, then we add 14 more protons and electrons before we get to hafnium. So these protons are increasing the effective nuclear charge and these electrons are falling into the same shell so the effective nuclear charge on the outer electrons has had increased by a great margin and so these are pulled in real tight and they are the same size as the transition metal group from period 5. So what are the results of the lanthanide contractions? I want to contract this page a bit so you can see the graph as we read this. Third transition series metals have the highest densities of all the elements. That's really high. Here they are. Look at osmium as the highest with a specific gravity of 22.6. Gold is 19.3, same as tungsten. Now iron is only about 8 and we consider iron to be fairly dense as metals go but no comparison to these third series transition metals. These third series transition metals have unusually high ionization energies. 
Not surprisingly, such a high net core nuclear charge would hold the electrons tightly, and therefore they are rather unreactive. Platinum and gold, right? Pretty unreactive metals, as are iridium and osmium. The third transition series metals have much higher oxidation resistance, right? Oxidation is loss of electrons, they resist losing electrons, as just explained in the previous point. The platinum metals, ruthenium, osmium, iridium, palladium and platinum, and gold, they do not form simple cations or even oxyanions. Gold and platinum are especially useful in low voltage circuits where trace oxidation would be a severe problem. Page 166. Page 166. Do you recall the Pauli exclusion principle? A maximum of two electrons can reside in an orbital when two electrons occupy the same orbital, their spins are paired or opposite. Let's talk about magnetism. So all electrons spin, and since all moving electric charges produce magnetic fields, therefore electrons behave as tiny magnets. They are like the original magnet. They're the source of magnetism, really. Here is an electron spinning counterclockwise. It produces a north magnetic field at the bottom. Here's an electron spinning clockwise, producing a north magnetic field at the top. And these opposite magnetic fields tend to attract each other, which helps to offset the electrostatic repulsion of like charges. When electrons are paired in orbitals, their spins are opposite. That is the lowest energy state for them, and so their magnetic fields cancel. Now substances with only paired electrons are called diamagnetic. Many diamagnetic materials, such as water, notice water has only paired electrons, are negligibly affected by magnetic fields. In fact, some diamagnetic objects, when placed in a magnetic field, are actually weakly repelled. Examples of diamagnetic elements include zinc, notice all paired electrons, 4s2, 3d10, cadmium, 5s2, 4d10, and so on. Here's a toy. It's a neat kit you can purchase on Amazon. It's a diamagnetic levitation kit. So a piece of pyrolytic graphite. Pyrolytic graphite is graphite that's been heated nearly to the point of decomposition. And when it cools, it forms plate-like structures that have unique properties. A piece of pyrolytic graphite will float in air above a magnet. Look at that, right there. It's floating in air. Levitation. Other than superconductors, Pyrolytic graphite is the strongest known diamagnetic material. It is strongly repelled by a magnetic field. When an atom possesses one or more unpaired electrons, the substance is said to be paramagnetic. Paramagnetic substances contain many weak atomic magnets, but in the solid phase, the magnetic fields are not aligned. Instead, they're randomly oriented. Here's a picture of a solid material with many arrows, magnetic fields, that are not aligned. When placed in a magnetic field, alignment of electrons spins with the external magnetic field occurs to some extent throughout the various domains or regions of the solid. So here is the solid with various regions aligning with the external magnetic field to some extent. And as a result, paramagnetic materials like aluminum and oxygen are weakly attracted to external magnetic fields. Perhaps you've seen a picture of liquid oxygen. It actually sticks to the poles of a strong magnet because oxygen is paramagnetic. Some metals exhibit strong magnetic properties. These materials are called ferromagnetic, and they are typically about a million times stronger than paramagnetic materials. Iron and cobalt and nickel are the only three common elements that are ferromagnetic. And they have four, three, and two unpaired d electrons, respectively. In ferromagnetic materials, after the external magnetic field is removed, the ferromagnetic material may remain magnetized as its electron spins remain aligned so it becomes a permanent magnet. Now, permanent magnets can become demagnetized by heating or pounding or melting. So, to summarize here, 
diamagnetic materials, substances that are weakly repelled by magnets. Here's some examples. And you can see the magnetic flux lines around this material are repelled by the material. Paramagnetic materials are weakly attracted by magnets and in a magnetic field a few of the magnetic flux lines will travel through a paramagnetic material. Ferromagnetic materials are strongly attracted by magnets and in a magnetic field magnetic flux lines tend to concentrate through a ferromagnetic material. Page 167. Recall the electron configuration of the first transition series metals. We just stated that nickel with two unpaired d electrons and cobalt with three and iron with four are the only common elements that are ferromagnetic. One might wonder and say, what about manganese? It's got five unpaired electrons and cobalt even has well, six. What about those? So here I've plotted the number of unpaired electrons, that is number of unpaired d electrons, across the th first transition series. And of course manganese has the most. Well, yes, unpaired electrons is a condition for ferromagnetism, but it's not the only condition. Ferromagnetism is a solid state property. So when individual paramagnetic atoms are correctly spaced, their magnetic fields readily align. And in manganese, the interatomic distance is not correct to allow optimal magnetic field alignment. But adding proper amounts of copper to manganese adjusts this interatomic spacing such that this alloy then becomes ferromagnetic. There are naturally occurring metal oxides that are ferromagnetic, like Fe3O4 is called magnetite, or CrO2 is called chromite. And there are metal alloys, such as, here's one, alnico alloy, iron alloy with aluminum, nickel, and cobalt. Transition metal solutions are found to exhibit magnetic properties, which depends upon the distribution of their d orbital electrons. Well, now this is interesting. We can get a, an indication of electron configuration by a solution's magnetic properties. So measuring magnetic properties. The magnetic character of transition metal complexes can be measured by means of a device called a Guoi balance. So a sample is hung from a balance so that it lies partly between the poles of an electromagnet. When the magnetic field is turned on, a paramagnetic material would be drawn in, pulled down, and so it seemed to weigh more as it lifts the counterweights on the opposite side. In contrast, a diamagnetic material, which is repelled, would be pushed up out of the field of the magnet when it's turned on and it would seem to weigh less. We're going to visit this again later in this chapter in our discussion of bonding in transition metal complexes. Page 168. Page 168. Acidity and basicity of transition metals. Recall we learned for the A group elements that oxy acids increase in acidity as the oxidation number of the central nonmetal increases. And here I have the oxy acids of chlorine listed. Hypochlorous acid, oxidation number plus one, pKa 7.5 weak acid. Chlorous acid, oxidation number plus three, has a pKa of plus two. That's almost a hundred thousand times more acidic than hypochlorous. Chloric acid, oxidation number plus five, is a thousand times more acidic than chlorous acid. And perchloric acid, pKa negative 10, that's 10 to the 9 times or a billion times more acidic than chloric acid. Oxidation number is plus 7. We saw that with the nonmetals. Well, the same trend is true for metals, believe it or not. The acidity of hydroxides and oxy acids of transition metals increases as the oxidation number of the central transition metal increases. This should seem like an oxymoron to you. Oxy acids of transition metals almost seems contradictory. We think of oxy acids of nonmetals, but not of metals. But take a look at the trend here. Manganese 2 oxide, it's a metal oxide in water, as expected, it's a base, manganese 2 hydroxide. Here's manganese 3 hydroxide in water, it's still a base, manganese 3 hydroxide, but it's a weak base. Yeah, it's almost amphoteric. 
manganese 4 hydroxide in water produces MnO OH taken twice. It's called manganous acid. It's amphoteric to weakly acidic. And manganese 6 oxide in water actually makes a strong acid, manganic acid, and manganese 7 oxide in water makes permanganic acid quite acidic. That's strange, isn't it? Look at chromium. Chromium 2 oxide, it's a metal oxide. We expect it to be basic. We put it in water, and sure enough, it's basic. It forms chromium 2 hydroxide. Chromium 3 oxide in water forms chromium 3 hydroxide. That's a weak base somewhat amphoteric. By the time you get to chromium 6 oxide in water, it actually is acidic. It's chromic acid. It's an oxy acid of a transition metal. Wow. General trends in acidity. The more electronegative the central atom in an oxy acid, whether it's a non-metal or a metal, the greater is the acidity. And the following sequence of increasing acidity from left to right with increasing electronegativity illustrates. So here we have germanic acid. These are electronegativity values I've written in 1.9. pKa is about 9. That's not as acidic as arsenic acid. Higher electronegativity on the non-metal pKa drops significantly. This is about the same strength as phosphoric acid which has the same electronegativity between arsenic and phosphorus. Selenic acid is stronger still because its electronegativity is larger, significantly more acidic, and then we have sulfuric acid, a little higher electronegativity and more acidic still. Also, for a given central atom, the acid strength increases with the number of oxygens it holds. So in the previous case I kept the number of oxygens the same and only varied the central atom, but here we can see sulfuric acid, which has one more oxygen than sulfurous, is a stronger acid. And of course then its oxidation number of the sulfur will be higher as we add more oxygens. The same is true of nitric is stronger than nitrous. Problem. Write the formula of all four oxy acids of bromine, name them and number them in order of an acidity where one is most acidic and four is least acidic and explain why this trend in acidity occurs and consider the oxidation states and the number of oxygen atoms. So I've actually done that down here. Hypobromous acid, oxidation state is plus one, one oxygen. Bromous acid, oxidation state plus three for bromine and two oxygens. Bromic acid, oxidation state plus five for bromine and three oxygens and perbromic acid, oxidation state plus seven and four oxygens. And as expected, the acidity increases as we add more oxygens as the oxidation number increases. So those are good trends that you should be aware of. They'll serve you well. Before we leave this page, I want to point one more thing out to you. Not only are the oxides of metals acidic in high oxidation states, but even the metal cations themselves, when they're highly charged, look at the group 1A metals, lithium, sodium, potassium. Remember that water has a pKa of 16, so these are clearly not acidic, they're quite neutral. Sodium is a very neutral ion. Adding sodium ion to solution will not affect the pH. And similarly, calcium and strontium, not really very acidic, although beryllium has some acidity. But as you go to higher oxidation states, particularly among the transition metals, pretty significant acidity. Look at scandium plus 3 ion. Its pKa is 4.3. Remember, acetic acid is 4.7. This is stronger than acetic acid. Look at titanium plus 3. Its pKa is 2.2. Well, that's stronger than hydrofluoric acid. And titanium plus 4 with a pKa of negative 4, well, that's more acidic, 10 times more acidic than sulfuric acid. Who would have thought it? There's a number of these polyvalent metal cations, meaning highly charged, not just singularly charged, but highly charged metal cations have acidity associated with them. And for some of them, it's pretty significant. Look at gold plus 3. Who would have thought of gold? cation as being a strong acid. Page 169. Transition metals as catalysts. 
Transition metals and their compounds function as effective catalysts in both homogeneous and heterogeneous reactions. Homogeneous would be single phase reactions. For example, all of the reagents and products and catalysts are all present in liquid solution. That would be homogeneous. But some reactions involve multiple phases. You might have a gas contacting a solid, for example, and that would be heterogeneous. The unreactive metals, such as platinum and palladium and nickel and gold, are sometimes used in a finely divided state to provide surfaces upon which heterogeneous reactions occur. Now you can appreciate if the reaction only occurs at the surface, then you don't want to waste any of this stuff. It would be a very, very thin layer of this expensive material on the surface of some inert material providing a catalyst source for reaction. The hydrogenation of unsaturated organic materials. In the fall semester, in your third semester, you'll be studying organic chemistry. We have a lab there where you take canola oil and using a palladium catalyst will hydrogenate it to make margarine. Other transition metals act as homogeneous catalysts having low energy d orbital vacancies that can accept electrons from reactants to form intermediates and then subsequently decompose. So all chemical reactions involve shuffling of electrons back and forth. And so if you can provide a space for these electrons to go to a low energy space, kind of like a bus depot, there'll be a lot of electrons shuffling around in there. If you can provide that, as catalysts do, then you can speed up chemical reactions. Here are some important industrial processes relying on catalysts. The Haber process, where nitrogen and hydrogen are combined to make ammonia, used to make explosives and fertilizers, brought about the, the greening of the world where a large increase in fertilizer production increased crop yields. Iron oxide catalyst is used for that. The contact process that makes sulfuric acid from sulfur trioxide, that reaction begins over vanadium 5 oxide catalyst. The hydrogenation reaction that I mentioned before, where oils and hydrocarbons can be hydrogenated using a nickel, palladium, or platinum catalyst. The Ostwald process combines nitrogen oxides with oxygen and then water to make nitric acid using a platinum catalyst. The catalytic converters in your automobile using palladium or platinum will speed up the oxidation of unburned carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons before they escape the tailpipe, converting them to carbon dioxide and water. And in a different section of the exhaust system, a rhodium catalyst will actually expedite the reduction of various nitrogen oxide compounds called NOx, reducing them to harmless nitrogen and oxygen. Linear polyethylene is polymerized using titanium or molybdenum catalysts and a variety of redox reactions utilize transition metal compounds such as molybdates and tungstates to bring about those reactions in a rapid fashion. So what is it about transition metals that make them good catalysts? They have empty or partially filled d orbitals where electrons can shuffle or transfer between atoms and ions. Page 170 Page 170, classification into subgroups. The transition metals, including zinc, cadmium, and mercury in group 2b, are divided into eight groups designated as B group elements. Let's just refresh our memories here. So we have group 3b, 4b, 5b, 6b, 7b, 8b, 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 1b, and 2b. What happened here? We'll talk about it in a minute. Now that number designates the maximum oxidation number of the group members. So if you're in group 3B, the maximum oxidation number is plus 3. If you're in group 4B, the maximum oxidation number is group 4. It isn't true in every case, but in most cases it is true. Despite some of these really high oxidation numbers, for example we have plus 8, just be aware that no simple ion of these elements possesses a charge greater than plus 3. So in tungstate ion, the oxidation number of tungsten is plus 6, but there's no such thing as a free ion of 
tungsten plus 6. It has to exist only in a polyatomic ion in which it doesn't have a full charge of plus 6. We assign it the oxidation number of plus 6. Elements in corresponding A and B groups form many compounds of identical stoichiometry. And we have some examples here. Group 1A, analogous to group 1B. So we have sodium chloride and copper 1 chloride, potassium nitrate, silver nitrate. Group 2B, magnesium bromide, analogous to zinc bromide in group 2B. Group 3A, similarly, we have gallium hydroxide, analogous to yttrium hydroxide and so on. Group 4A, we have lead 4-oxide, zirconium 4-oxide. Group 5A, here's phosphate analogous to vanadate. Again, we're comparing group 5A and group 5B. Group 6A, sulfate, similar to chromate. The stoichiometry of their formulas is analogous with the same group numbers. And group 7A, we have chlorine 7 oxide and 7B we have manganese 7 oxide. So there's a lot of similarities there that are helpful in writing formulas. Despite similar stoichiometry in the compounds, their chemical properties of A group and B group elements are usually quite dissimilar. Okay, group 1B and 2B metals have fill D orbitals. Group 1B, here's D10, and filled D and S orbitals in group 2B. These have what are called pseudo noble gas configurations. Odd expression, pseudo means like. So in a sense they're like noble gases and they have some unusual stability. Isn't it good that silver and gold and copper have unusual stability? Their properties are wonderful. In contrast, recall, the group 1A and 1B metals are very reactive and never found unreacted in a native state. What about group 8B? Remember there were three group 8Bs? It consists of three columns of three metals each. Each horizontal row is called a triad. Sounds like a drug ring. Named after the best known metal of the row. For example, we have the iron triad, the palladium triad, and the platinum triad. Greater horizontal similarities than vertical similarities are found in group 8B. Recall the iron triad metals, iron, cobalt, and nickel are the only common elements in the periodic table that exhibit ferromagnetism in the uncombined state. Problem 2 says, without looking this up, write the formula of a common oxide of tungsten, which is in group 6B. Well, I think a safe guess would be to say, if it's in group 6B, it has oxidation state plus 6. So what would be the formula of an oxide of tungsten with an oxidation state of plus 6. I would bet it would be WO3, tungsten 6 oxide. And I'm probably right in this case. How about a naturally occurring oxide of osmium in group 8B? Well, I can say then that osmium is going to have a maximum oxidation state of plus 8, so I can write OSO4. This is probably a good place to stop for this first lesson on transition metals.